And then two, I will try to close this out. I'll try to be the Rod Beck of, of uh, TEDx closers and close it out. And uh, I want to start by saying one of my favorite quotes is, uh, you will never not love somebody if they tell you their story. So with that, here is mine. <laughs> I had a great childhood. I really did. I look back now and I don't think you never, I don't think you fully realize how great your childhood is unless you have uh, the ability to look back and see uh, how good you had it. And I had it so good because of three things. I never had to worry about the food in my stomach, the clothes on my back, or the roof over my head, which tears up a little bit, but we'll get through it. Um, my biggest concern, really, was the third pumpkin I didn't get at the pumpkin patch in, 19, in 1987. My mother's actually in the crowd. Uh, to this day, I have no idea why she didn't get me that third pumpkin. It's traumatized me forever. To this day, Halloween still a very rough day for me. Not because of ghouls, goblins, and ghosts, but because of the pumpkin I wanted the most. Um, but beyond those three things, I also had great parents. Great parents. Um, my dad's fashion sense in the early 80s could be a little questionable. Uh, my mother came very classic, always beautiful. Thank you, mother, for at least doing getting half right. But I had great parents, and I had great parents because, and this is the number one thing I think makes a great parent, they were 100% supportive of me every step of the way. Um, they always believed in me, and it, that means so much. And, <clears throat> sorry. The support is huge, especially when you're young. And again, looking back, you don't realize the support and how valuable it is until you look back and you go, wow, that was because of them. But with that support came one thing. I had to give 100% effort. Uh, they didn't care about the result. A lot of times it was, you can't control the result, but you can't control your effort. So that stuck with me. And I'm not sure it was the best advice, but it was the advice they gave me. And so to this day, I'm either 100% in or I'm zero. I'm either on the couch or I'm in the game, but there's no in between. And the way I know this, looking back, is, and we'll go here, I grew up here. This is Alameda, California, great place to grow up. Uh, I loved every minute of it. It's a fantastic place. Um, and I had the benefit of growing up next to one of my best friends. And so we would often play together. And this is the story of the first time I really knew that I was either 100% or nothing. I walk out of the front door, and he is hitting a basketball with an uh, aluminum bat. And I thought, that's awesome. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and I run down there, and uh, we'll call my friend Shaman. And he says, yeah, go ahead. He throws the uh, basketball at me, and I go to hit it. And the second he threw it, he knew this was going to go bad. And he was three blocks down before I even hit the, hit the ball. But I go to hit the basketball, and I tomahawk chop it. And hopefully you know where this goes. The aluminum bat ricochets off the basketball, hits me square in the head, and I knocked myself out completely, <laughs> utterly cold. In fact, for anybody that's been hit, sometimes you get hit so hard it doesn't even hurt. Uh, that was that, and then that was also the concrete that I also hit afterwards. And it also happened at the exact same time my mother was walking out of the front door to scream supper for dinner. So she walks out, sees her son, hit uh, you know, a basketball with him in the bat, and knock himself out cold. The next thing I remember, she is carrying me up the stairs into the house screaming bloody murder, and I was banned from playing two sports for one year from one single instance. <laughs> uh, in fact, for the next year it was, uh, Mom, I'm gonna go play. What are you playing? Not baseball, not basketball. No. No. Um, it was around the same time, and if we can go back, around the time, um, I recognized something else. I was 10, my dad was in his early 40s, and I realized, and again, this is looking back, he hated his job. Hated it. He used to take the bus to San Francisco, he used to come home, and he hated it. Um, I'm not to this day, I have no idea what he did. I, I, I think he tried to explain it once, and I. I found this interesting, but never knew what he did, but I knew that he was extremely happy or happiest when he was at his architectural drawing board. So when he was drawing sketches and plans, that's when he was happiest. And it was right around this time that he decided he was going to leave California, he was going to pick up uh, his, uh, the family and move to Washington to go get his architectural degree. And 
Uh, so I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go with him. My mother and I stayed in California. And that moment was huge because I saw, I saw the amount he was willing to risk for his passion. And that meant a lot as well. So we leave and uh, I'm still very proud of him. He became an architect in Seattle. He ran his own business. He actually now works for the city of Seattle. So very proud of him. But that stuck with me in a huge way. Uh, and it would be really uh, reflected in, in high school when I think most high schoolers, that's when you start get, getting a chance to make some decisions on your own uh, because you're starting to apply to college. I went to a great high school in Oakland, California, Bishop O'Dowd, and you are expected to make a decision. You're going to college, and that's when the questions start. What do you want to do with the rest of your life? What are you going to do? What are you going to be? What are you going to major in? What are you going to do? And that really, I wouldn't say stressed me out, but it was one of those things where I wanted to know. I really wanted to know because not only did my dad figure out his architectural thing. My mother went back later for her degree to be a teacher. So they both, I watched both of them witness hating their jobs and going back to do something that they wanted to do. Um, now, the, the, the individuals I got the question the most from, what are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to do? Were my grandparents. And I had two great grandparents. My mother, uh, my grandmother was the sweetest old lady. Uh, she made the best fried chicken I've ever had. And my grandfather was fantastic. He would beat the living hell out of us in Monopoly every summer, mercilessly. We'd be sitting there, nine years old. He'd be destroying me and my cousins. We'd be crying. He'd be telling us we're not going to play if you're going to cry. Of course, it only makes you cry more. Uh, and he would just, it was what it was. It, looking back, you're like, Grandpa, how, you couldn't let us win once? He just mopped us. So great grandparents, really great. Um, but around, around 16, around college, around going to college, they started asking. And they would not stop asking. Uh, and I always found it a little weird because their son didn't know until he was post 40. And here I was, 16, expected to know what I wanted to do. And I made it worse as well. I didn't help the situation because they, as they got older, grandparents, were more conservative. And I came from a very liberal place, very proud San Francisco Bay Area, uh, go Warriors in the finals. But came from a very liberal place, huge fan of hip hop and rap, still am. I had the baggy clothes, baggy shirts, hat backwards. And to top it all off, I'm going to this, that's me with the hat backwards. Um, I wore diamond earrings, but not just any diamond earrings, because you're like, what's wrong with diamond earrings? Nothing. Um, I wore diamond earrings that originally came from a brooch that my great-grandmother had given my mother, who my grandmother had then given my father, who my father had then given my mother in a marriage that hadn't come back after the divorce, and I was wearing them in my ears in front of my grandmother where boys shouldn't wear earrings. So that was the, the top notch where it was just like, that was the, the head scratcher there. My grandmother would ask me, what are you going to be with the rest of your life? And I had, I had no idea. So I would push her buttons because I didn't have an answer. So she would say, what do you want to be? And I would say, well, Grandma, I thought about this long and hard. I hadn't. Uh, I want to do import-export. And she'd say, import-export what? I'd like to export large amounts of black tar heroin and import <laughs> non-sequential $100 bills. And she'd say, <laughs> you're going to be a drug dealer. And I said, Grandma Kingpin. Uh, <laughs> And I said, you know, drug dealers are ounces and grams, pounds and kilos. Uh, which, of course, you know, I was her baby grandson as well. I was the first one. So my grandson's not going to be a drug dealer. I said, kingpin grandma. Um, <laughs> and this would continue. Next summer would be, what do you want to be? And of course, and she said, and you can't say, I'm like, grandma, I'm done. I'm past the kingpin thing. I said, I'm going to purchase large amounts of ammunition and weapons and take them from one location to the next and resell them. And she says, you sound like a gun runner. They said, well, more like a Second Amendment advocate, but agree to disagree. <laughs> and this would continue in phases from mercenary to rapper to, you know, whatever would push your buttons the most until really it stopped or I, I knew what I wanted to do. And it just so happens that in my junior college, still didn't know, desperately wanted to know, I took a trip through New Zealand and Australia. And when I was in Australia, an uh, individual that I was snorkeling with grabbed my, my, my uh, flipper and I turned and I saw a green sea turtle, and that was it. And so from one day, I had no idea what I wanted to do. It was a big contentious point that I definitely wanted to know what I wanted to do. And in one instant, one moment, it's over. And uh, I tell you this because I hope 
for one, if any of you are in here and you're young and you don't know what you want to do, you don't have to know what you want to do. If you're older and you know what you want to do, please go after it. Or if you don't know what you want to do, there's still plenty of time. And I hope that if you are wanting to know what you want to do, be open to experiences that will lead you to become, hopefully, what you want to do or find what you want to do. So if, if you're in a, I don't want to call it rut, but if you're going through and you can't quite figure it out, take a trip, uh, expose yourself to something new, I think you will hopefully find what it is that you want to do, and that is a beautiful moment. Because it led me to this very moment here. And here is a spectacular place. And I'm about to tell you why. Um, and the reason is, we have sea turtles. And uh, I, again, I owe everything to sea turtles. I really do. Uh, my father gave a beautiful toast at my wedding. Um, and he said the whole wedding was because of sea turtles. And it was. I met my wife with sea turtles and great friends. So really all to them. Sorry. But getting back on track. Um, we have an incredible habitat here. We really do. I, I hope uh, the second part I leave you with, the first part is find what you want to do in life. The second part is I hope you realize how incredible St. Thomas is because of, and I'm going to try to get through this quickly, the Sierra Lee King Runway. So most of you maybe uh, have take, taken off in a plane or landed in a plane or at least been to the airport to pick up friends, but you are aware of this, this habitat. That runway after a plane crash in 76 was expanded. That is the expansion. It's 1,800 meters around. It is six hectares in terms of area, so quite large, and it's artificial. And what's fascinating about it is it looks, or it is, uh, a densely, um, it has a large population densely packed of Caribbean hawksbill sea turtles. Now, we have three sea turtle populations here in the Virgin Islands. We have leatherbacks who come through a nest, and then in most bays, Around St. Thomas and St. John, you can see greens or you can see hawksbills. Hawksbills are uh, the species that is critically endangered. Critically endangered means there is a great concern that they will become extinct in the near future. And so, very serious. There's roughly about 250 seats in this auditorium. Uh, if, you were to if you were to compare that to the historical population of hawksbill sea turtles, which are considered to be at 2 to 5 percent of their uh, historic level pre-European colonization, there'd be between two and ten, or sorry, four, four and ten of you would be left. So all of you would be gone, there'd be four to ten people I'd be talking to. That's what's left of the Caribbean Hawksville population. So everyone is extremely, extremely vital. Especially, if you look at the top left picture, that is a very, very small Hawksville. So Hawksville sea turtles, like all sea turtle species, they are laid in nests on a beach, 60 days, they come up, they, they uh, go into the ocean, they float around for a number of years, and at about uh, 19, 20, early 20 centimeters, they recruit to a near shore habitat like St. Thomas. And it's, it's very special to see them that young because it means they're fresh off that stage, and it also allows us to start baseline data collection right then. So if we catch them and see them right then, uh, we can see how quickly they grow. Uh, and you can compare that to other sites, and then you get a, how productive is this habitat? Is our habitat more productive than others? You can also see uh, how long they're here for. This turtle, all our turtles here, highly li unlikely that they're born on St. Thomas. Probably coming from other rookeries around Caribbean, uh, Mexico, Antigua, Barbados. So they are not from here. They will not remain here. They will be here for a a limited time frame, and then they will move on to their next stage. And hopefully, my hope is that we can assist them in getting to that next life stage so that we can continue to have Hawksville sea turtles. And what makes this so interesting is I don't think anyone planned for this to happen. So this runway was created, and how it was built, it appears, unfortunately, we'll never see data from before when the uh, runway wasn't there, but it's very densely populated, which means they like it for a reason. It's part of something for a reason. And that reason could be, and what I'm looking at is, how much food's growing there and, uh, and how big these crevices are. If you get a chance, and if any of you want to come out with me, I'd be more than glad to take you out there. Um, there's huge concrete dolos used in the construction of the runway. It created huge crevices for these small turtles to hide, so I think they're very safe there and they can grow up. And so what's beautiful about this is we have an extraordinary habitat on St. Thomas. And 
what we can learn from that habitat is important for the overall species survival, especially considering Caribbean reefs aren't doing so well. So can we learn something about essentially artificial reef creation to benefit another species? And we are in St. Thomas next door in the British Virgin Islands. They're talking about expanding their runway. Can you do it as friendly, environmentally friendly and constructive towards an endangered species like a hawksbill sea turtle? And so what I hope to leave you here today with, next time you fly off this, this runway, it's incredible. It is one of a kind. Most runways are just slabs, um, you know, slabs of ground with concrete over it. This is not that. This is an artificial habitat that is conducive towards a beautiful and extremely critically endangered species. And it's where conservation and passion take flight, guys. All right?